Someone sent me the Quranic miracle of Haman as proof that Islam is true. Ironically, some Christians also point to Haman in the Quran as evidence that Islam is false. What interests me about this controversy is that it perfectly illustrates a question that I've raised many times. Namely, why would God allow the evidence for Islam to be open to even the slightest contention or debate in the first place? One could forgive such indifference had there been no consequences to disbelief. But when the consequences are an eternity of the most horrific torture, it is inexcusable. The name Haman appears six times in the Qur'an, along with the pharaoh of Moses, usually identified as either Ramesses II or Manepta. He is first mentioned in Surah Al-Qasas, along with a reference to baby Moses being cast into the river. Then later when Moses comes to Haman and Pharaoh with clear proofs, and when Haman is commanded to build a tower so Pharaoh can look upon the god of Moses. Like Pharaoh, Haman is described as an oppressor, sinful, boastful and arrogant. The Quran presents Haman as an extremely important figure in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. It even mentions the soldiers of Egypt as being their soldiers, Junuduhuma, referring to both Pharaoh and Haman. Critics of Islam have argued that Muhammad confused the biblical story of Haman in the book of Esther and the reference in Genesis to the building of the Tower of Babylon with the story of Moses and Pharaoh. In response to this, Maurice Bucal, author of the Bible, the Quran and Science, decided to search a book of ancient Egyptian names by the renowned Egyptologist Herman Rank. He came across a name HMNH, who according to a reference in another book by Walter Wozinski, had the job of chief of the stone quarry workers. So Bukal decided this must be the Haman of the Quran, and he declared that Muhammad couldn't have known his name because hieroglyphs had become a lost language by then and were only rediscovered relatively recently. This has now become a popular miracle claim promoted by many preachers such as Norman Ali Khan, who added that there was a statue of him in Austria. As I said in a previous video about scientific miracles, in order to definitively prove such claims, there cannot be any possible alternative explanations, and the language must be accurate and precise. Unfortunately, the Haman claim fails on all counts. Firstly, even if the name was the same, it doesn't mean it's the same person, as Muslims themselves will argue, regarding the biblical Haman. Secondly, the name HMNH is obviously not an exact match for Haman. Not only is there an extra H at the end, and of course we don't know what vowels were used, but the hieroglyph for both the first and the last H is a hard H, as in my own name, Hassan, and not a soft H, as in Haman. Ancient Egyptian script does have a hieroglyph for the soft H, but it wasn't used. So either the ancient Egyptians misspelt his name, or the Qur'an does. To get around the problem of the extra H at the end, Bukal claims that the question mark at the end of the entry is because Rank wasn't sure if the last letter should be dropped, so Bukal suggests it should be. But this is clearly not true. Rank was not questioning whether the last letter should be dropped, he was suggesting whether the name was an abbreviation for HMNHTP, meaning Hemen Hetep, which means Hemen is merciful. Hemen was the falcon god of ancient Egypt. You can see the footnote says, and you'll have to forgive my German, Ob abgekürz für HMNFTP, which is German for whether abbreviated for HMNFTP. In other words, he is of the opinion the full name is actually Hemen Hetep. Hemen is merciful. If you look at the entry below the one in question, you can see why Rank suggests this. The name just below it is exactly that name, H-M-N-H-T-P, Hemen is merciful. And there is another name just above the entry in question that also begins with H-M-N and means Hemen is great. Rank's suggestion is clearly the likely meaning, particularly since ancient Egyptians didn't simply take the names of their gods on their own, but as part of a phrase indicating their devotion or an aspect of their god.
much like we would not call our son Allah, but rather Abdullah. Also, the job title of this individual was not Chief of the Stone Quarry Workers, it was Chief of the Stone Quarry Workers of Amun. The last part is significant because there were several gods and many stone quarries. This individual clearly had a much lesser role than that of the man described in the Qur'an, whose role wasn't overseeing stone quarries, but was chief minister and close confidant to the pharaoh. As for Nu'aman Ali Khan's assertion that there is a statue of him, They actually have a statue in Austria, I believe. Haman written on it underneath. They revived it from Egypt. His name is Haman in Austria. The statue is sitting there. It never ceases to amaze me how lazy some people are when it comes to checking facts that support their beliefs yet they demand the highest rigour when it comes to anything that challenges them. The statue he's referring to is of Hamiyunu, the architect of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and vizier to King Khufu. They lived during the Old Kingdom, over 1,000 years prior to the individual named in the inscription, who, like Ramses and Menepta, lived during the New Kingdom. He is a completely different person and could never have met Moses and Pharaoh. And as yet another miracle claim regarding Prophet Yusuf and the king of Egypt points out, the rulers were not called Pharaoh at that time. Astonishingly, it seems Norman Ali Khan was already aware his statue claim wasn't true, because he adds, Now we don't know for sure if that's the Hamad of, 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 you know, of the Qur'an. Well, actually, yes, we do know. It isn't the Hamam of the Qur'an. And also, his name isn't Haman. So what do I think of this miracle claim? I'm afraid, just like all the other miracle claims, it's simply a case of seeing what one wants to see. I suspect Muslims will tell me, but you also see what you want to see. And although I try my best to be balanced and fair, I fully accept that no human is free from bias, and I don't pretend to be an exception. Every single human being sees things from their perspective and through the lens of their own viewpoints, and that includes Muslims. Do you really think Muslims who proclaim this miracle are not influenced by their biases also? Regardless of what you may personally think about this miracle claim, perhaps we can at least agree that it is possible for others, from their perspective, to remain unconvinced, not because they're wicked or dishonest, but because from their point of view the evidence is, at best, inconclusive. Which leads me to the real problem with this whole idea that Islam can be proven through miracle claims or apologetics. An all-knowing God would be fully aware that neither merit nor blame could be apportioned to a person for accepting or rejecting evidence that he has allowed to be open to perfectly reasonable contentions. It is inconceivable that a wise and compassionate God would base entry to an eternal garden or an eternal torture chamber on whether you were able to accept one set of debatable apologetics over another to uncover miraculous proof for Islam, hidden like Easter eggs in obscure books and words with multiple meanings, so long as you can find the right lexicon and drop the last letter. We are talking about an omnipotent, omniscient divine being who created the vast universe with its infinite galaxies and stars, yet then suppose him to be so careless and indifferent, so clumsy and bungling, that he cannot competently convey his most crucial message on which rests the eternal destination of humanity and would damn the sceptic to everlasting torture? It is one of the greatest ironies that many who claim to think so highly of God in reality think so little of him.